All right, so we're still continuing in the Unified Christians series here. Uh, we had been talking about leadership in the past few sermons. We're swapping to a, a new subject tonight. Um, so Unified Christianity, Godly Defenders, part one. So there, there will be a part two to this. And we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 4 for the first part of this. Bullies. Anybody dealt with any bullies before? <laughs> it's kind of hard not to. I'm sure we've all had our run-ins with them, at least seen them, you know, doing their thing to other people and all this. But they always think that they're the ones that's in charge. And they want to try to call all the shots and tell you what to do and what not to do. They always seem to pick on those that are smaller and weaker than them. And they will usually win until everyone comes together to stand against them. And that's what we're going to look at here in Nehemiah. We're going to see a scene just like that. So... Here in Nehemiah chapter 4, it says, Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O oh, oh our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard that we were repairing the walls of Jerusalem and was going forward, and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted to come together to come and fight against Jerusalem to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. And that time the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So the picture we see here is Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites were all coming together. They were joining forces, threatening at least to come and fight the Jews. These bullies, though, give us an insight to what we see every day because the Bible doesn't just tell us what happened it tells us what always happens so what we see here we see the the tactics that they're using so the first thing that we see in verses 1 through 3 they're mocking and scoffing so a mocker is a person who teases or laughs at someone in a scornful or contemptuous manner. And a scoffer 
is a person who speaks to or about someone in a scornfully derisive or mocking way. So they're very similar. And if you if you had two sitting here, I don't know if I could tell you the, the difference because they're that similar. Proverbs gives us another look. Proverbs 21, 24 says, Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. So the definitions we use today just talk about the verbal side of it. But Proverbs says that there's a physical act to it too. And if you think about it, it is true. We hear people mocking folks and talking about them. But what about the times when somebody says something and we make a gesture like, like, oh, they're just running their mouth. They're just flapping their gums. We're mocking them with our gesture, with our act. Even when maybe we don't do this, maybe we just sigh kind of heavily and roll our eyes. That's a way that we're scoffing at people. In Second Peter 3.3, 3, it says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They're going to be here. There's no getting around it. In Luke 16, 14, it says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. So they ridiculed Jesus. So he had to deal with these kinds of people too. And if we looked at his life, he definitely had to deal with a lot of those people. But we have to remember what Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.29. He says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So we don't need to join in with the mockers and the scoffers. We only need to say the things that build up, that encourage. Because when we don't do that, when we join the mockers and the scoffers, we're just adding to the pain and the the burdens and everything else that they're putting on people. We, we definitely don't need to do that. In verses 7 through 9 and 11 in Nehemiah chapter 4, we see... Two more things, threatening and confusion. Confusion is usually a byproduct of something else. So in this particular section, the threats of violence that they were giving the Jews, those threats were causing confusion amongst everybody. In 1 Corinthians 14.33, it says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, for context in this passage, Paul is talking about orderly worship in the church. However, it does go beyond that. God doesn't want us to be confused about anything. He doesn't want us to be scratching our heads and trying to figure out what's going on. He wants us to know what's going on, even if it's just a situation where we sit back and wait on him he doesn't want confusion though when Sanballat and Tobiah couldn't get what they wanted by just mocking and making fun and starting that route that's when the threat starts so it escalated Bullies don't typically start at 100% because they don't want to do that much work unless they have to. But they they try to get away with as little as possible. If you push back against that, they slowly escalate. But now that we can see the tactics, now that we can see what happens, 
And I think we would all agree that even today, it still kind of follows that same progression. How can we stand up against it? How can we be like Nehemiah here? First thing, be the line. Be the line. King David is a very good example of this. It says David was a man after God's own heart. He was also a very great warrior, a lion. In 1 Samuel 17, 34, verses 37, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And we, when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. The first thing I notice about this, he is killing bears and lions with his bare hands. I, I by no means am claiming to be the manliest man, but they don't make them like that anymore. That takes that takes a real line to take on those kinds of animals. But what we what we see there is David did whatever he had to do to protect his flock. Even, you know, killing bears and lions with his bare hands. Like I I just can't wrap my head around that. That is just wild. But using this as an example, we need to be that line. We need to be that sort of protector for our families, for our church. Because, let's face it, evil, like real evil, not going to stop itself. Somebody has to be that shepherd like David was. And step in there to protect the family and the church. Second thing, be the lamb. Be the lamb. Again, King David is another great example of this. In 2 Samuel 3, verses 31 through 34, it said, Then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed the bier. They buried Abner at Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, Should Abner die as, fool, as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not fettered. As one who falls before the wicked, you have fallen. So here we see another picture of David, but he's not fighting, killing, protecting, being that lion, being that warrior. What's he doing? He's crying. He's weeping over the death of Abner. Publicly at that, he's publicly lamenting. He's showing that he's not all lying. He's not all warrior, that he has a softer side. He has the ability to connect with people on that emotional level. We also see that with Jesus when he wept over the death of Lazarus, his friend. Again, a, a man, a lion, weeping. Be the lamb. We should take this example and we should be that lamb with 
our family and with our church. And notice the line is for our family and our church, and the lamb is with our family and our church. None of this is possible without love. Love binds all of this together. We cannot be lion or lamb for anyone if we don't love them. If we don't love one another, we won't bother protecting them. We'll walk right past them. Not my problem. Not my circus, not my monkeys. Whatever little cliche saying you want to put in there, we'll walk right past them and never bat an eye. If we don't love them, we won't bother helping them when there's an emotional need, when there's healing that needs to take place. Again, we will walk right past them and not bother to say a word, to not bother to put our hands on them and pray, to not bother to ask them, how's your day going? Love is where it starts. In 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11, it said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It all starts with love. God is love. It says it right there. And he loves us more than we can ever imagine. And that's why he is both lion and lamb for us. And it was Jesus' love for us that drives him to be lion and lamb for us. In John thirteen thirty four. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So even Jesus himself says, love one another. That's where it all starts. And our love for each other is what will drive us to be the lion when we need to be and to be the lamb when we need to be. So, as we kind of close this up, it's a little bit shorter tonight. There's three examples that I want to look at. First is Jesus. He is our perfect example. He is the perfect balance of both lion and lamb. He is what we should all strive to be like. As you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see lots of examples of kids running up to Jesus, women giving their babies to him so he can pray over them and bless them, him healing people, sitting down and talking with the woman at the well, all kinds of stuff that you can see lamb. Everybody can see lamb when they look at him. On the flip side, when he's rebuking the Pharisees, you see a small glimpse of lion. We won't see full lion until he comes back the second time. And if we're following him and we're on Team Jesus, we won't see full lion. We will only see lamb, but those who aren't following Jesus will see him in full lion mode, and it will not be pretty for those people.
But for us to be like Jesus, we have to have a balance. We can't be all line. We can't be all lamb. If we are all line, we will neglect our family and our church of any sort of emotional support that they'll need. However, if we're all lamb, we will neglect the family and our church of any physical support or protection that they need. So how do we know if we're too much lion or we're too much lamb? And the two examples that we're going to look at, I don't want it to come across as I'm condemning or judging these, these two, only looking at them as a way that we can learn. Because I'm a big proponent of using the Bible as a mirror to examine ourselves first. So as we look at these these two individuals, if we notice things in ourself, then maybe that's a good place to start to say, well, maybe I'll lean a little more this way or a little more that way. Our first example, though, is Adam. Adam was too much lamb. In Genesis 3, 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to, to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Adam was there with Eve when she ate from the forbidden tree. And he stood by and watched her pick the fruit and take a bite. And then he ate right after her. He didn't say anything. He knew what God told him. Eat from any tree except this one. But he did not stand up for God's rules. He did not get in the way when the serpent was there convincing eve to eat from the tree in the first place didn't say a word too much lamb now i know that may sound like an extreme case i think well adam you know that particular scene that particular thing caused the fall of all men but it 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 it, it's not that extreme because if you think about it it was several little things that added up that adam if he had a little more line could have stopped he could have prevented it how much do we let slide in our own lives how much do we look and go oh it's not that big of a deal and next thing you know we've missed a whole month's worth of Sundays coming to church or oh it's no big of a deal next thing you know you're cussing like a sailor oh it's not that big of a deal next thing you know you're drinking for breakfast stuff catches up with you right there in this example in Genesis it started small and it grew very big very quick the little things that we overlook the little things that we're not quite lying enough with get out of hand quick. How much do we, quote, unquote, conveniently overlook with our families? How much do we say, you know, that really doesn't line up with God's word, but I'm going to overlook it. And I'm going to let them have their way. And I'm just going to sit back and not say a word when I should be talking with them about it. But we conveniently overlook things with our family. How much do we sweep under the rug in the church? How much do we see going on, but we don't want to have that tough conversation with somebody? Shouldn't we be protecting as many as we can from the enemy? It's not always full frontal assault like it is here 
being threatened here, at least in Nehemiah, where it's army against army. Sometimes it's those subtle things like with Eve. Are you sure God didn't tell you you could eat from that tree? Sometimes it's little things that creep in that we need to be focused on, we need to be aware of, and we need to be lion warrior enough to nip it in the bud before it gets out of hand. Our second example, Samson. Samson was too much lion. So in Judges 14, verse 19 through chapter 15, verse 2, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spool and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. After some days, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat, and he said, I will go in to my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought you utterly hated her, but I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. Samson, right after they got married, just left, walked off and left his wife, didn't finish what was the normal marital ceremonies by taking his wife in his chamber, as he calls it here, on their wedding night. He just left. He was mad because somebody figured out his riddle, and he left. He went back to his folks' house. It doesn't say for how long. It just says after some days. I do find it interesting, like, why he took a goat. <laughs> I don't know why he took a goat, but he took a goat with him. But after some days, he goes back and just wants to pick it up where he left off like nothing ever happened. But even, even her dad was like, man, I thought you hated her. And that's why you left. So... I gave her to your best man. But there was no emotional attachment there. They they were technically physically separated while he was gone. But there was never any kind of emotional connection there. And even if he were there, it's still possible to be emotionally separate. Because you read on through the story of Samson after he meets up with Delilah, they were physically present together, but they were emotionally separate. Samson didn't want to have that emotional relationship with her and be there as a lamb. He had lied to her several times about where the source of his strength come from. And in Judges 16, 16, it says that the only reason he told her was because she kept asking day after day, and it vexed his soul to death, is the only reason he finally told her. Which, kind of off my notes, um, ladies, please don't nag your husbands to death. And guys, don't give them a reason to nag you to death. We don't, we don't need any vexed souls in here. But Samson had a, 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 a an I don't care attitude. The only thing he found fun, if you will, was killing Philistines. Really, that's the only thing he ever showed any, you know, drive to do. But that kind of attitude, not being there, you know, that, that having that kind of attitude can get you in trouble because in Judges 15, it says that even the men of Judah turned against him. So he was, not only was he not there 
for his first wife and for Delilah. He wasn't even there for his own countrymen. Like he wouldn't even tell them like what was going on. And in, in that particular scene, some Philistines had come up into Judah looking for him. And the men of Judah were like, you know what? We're on your side this time. We're going to help you catch him. And they did. But like Samson, how often do we overlook or suppress our own emotions? How often do we, ah, I ain't worried about that, crying. What, what, cry? Nope, we don't cry. Shove that down. We don't cry. How often do we ask ourselves, like, why do I keep getting frustrated in this particular scenario or in this particular scenario? Why do I always seem to just zone out when my spouse or my kids are trying to tell me about their day? Why, you know, why do I have these particular emotions? How often do we actually examine ourselves like that? Do our families seek us for that emotional support or do they seek someone else? Your child has a bad day at school. Do they come home, tell you about it to get your help, to get your support? Or do they bottle it up and save it for someone else? Spouse has a bad day at work. Same thing. Do they come home and tell you? Or do they save it for someone else? Do you listen when they tell you? Do other church members see us as supportive in that area? So when we come to church, are we the ones that everybody comes to for that emotional support for that prayer? Or do they seek someone outside the church? Again, be the line for your family. Be the lamb with your family and your church. As you examine yourself and try to figure out, do I weigh heavier on the lion side or do I weigh heavier on the lamb side I would encourage everyone once you figure that out find the opposite and try to make friends so if you weigh heavy on the lion side find someone who weighs heavy on the lamb side and y'all start hanging out that way the one who weighs heavy on the lamb can pick up pointers from the line. How can I be more assertive? How can I not be so fearful to stand up for what God says to do and to stand up for my family and any other sorts of wrongs that I happen to see? And the one who's a lion can learn from the lamb. How can I be more emotionally supportive and things like that for my family and my wife? But just remember, love is what makes it all possible. And without that, we can't be unified in helping each other. Because we need to have that unity to help us all be as balanced as we possibly can. So that none of us are too much lion or too much lamb. That unity also means that we have to be humble enough to receive that from someone else and to say you know what you're right i am too much lion or i am too much lamb and i want to balance that scale so i've got one last verse out of nehemiah that i want to look at because i'm going to let nehemiah have the last word in all of this We've seen the threats. We've seen the mockery 
everything else that he had to deal with. And we've seen the lion come out in him when he set the guard up. But we haven't seen lamb yet. The last verse is where we see that. It's probably one of the greatest motivational lines in the Bible. I know there's probably a lot of debate around that, but just from normal, everyday human beings, I think this is one of the greatest motivational lines. But before we cover that, all of this that we've talked about so far can be applied to each one of us individually. As we looked at in the leadership sermons the past few weeks, the higher you are in leadership, from family to junior leadership in church, senior leadership, and so on, the more important it is to have that balanced scale. Because if you are appointed high enough in leadership and you are too much lamb, anything can come into the church at that point and destroy a lot of lives. If you are too much lying and you make it that high, you are going to be a dictator and you are going to rule with an iron fist and you are going to destroy a lot of lives. It's very important that like Nehemiah here, where a good balance will never be perfect like Jesus, but we a good balance of lion and lamb. So the last verse, great motivation for everyone. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 14 says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight, and we just want to thank you again, Lord, for this chance to study your word and together under your name and your authority and we just ask lord that you help us all to just soak in the message that you had for us tonight help us all to remember it as we go forward through our lives and just help us lord to recall it whenever we need it help us to have that balanced scale as close as we possibly can help us to stand up for the things that we know are wrong and that we need to stand up for but help us to be gentle and loving when we need to be. And Lord, I just ask that you be with all of us as we leave here and head home. I ask, Lord, that you just watch over us and protect us. I ask that you watch over the rest of our church family that isn't here and protect them. And I ask that you just bless us all, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you just continue to watch over the church and Protect it and bless it as well. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.